Welcome to the Industrial IoT Spotlight, your number one spot for insight from industrial IoT thought leaders who are transforming businesses today with your host, Eric Walenza. Welcome back to the Industrial IoT Spotlight podcast. I'm your host, Eric Walenza, CEO of IoT One. And our guest today is Brian Watkins, CEO of Federated Wireless. Federated Wireless provides cloud-native private wireless solutions as an end-to-end managed service using the CBRS spectrum. In this talk, we discuss the value of connectivity as a service for improving the performance and cost structure of industrial use cases. We also explored the rollout of 5G and the implications for edge computing use cases from AGVs to large-scale device management. If you find these conversations valuable, please leave us a comment and a five-star review. And if you'd like to share your company's story or recommend a speaker, please email us at team at iot1.com. Thank you. Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. Eric, happy, happy to be with you guys and talk about my favorite subject, anything to do with IoT. Yeah, awesome. Well, before we get into the, the topic and really into Federated Wireless, would be great to understand where you're coming from. So I, you have an interesting background. I mean, you've, you've worked with a lot of the, the bigger players here with Ericsson, Dell, uh, Intel, Samsung, and then about a little bit more than a year and a half ago, you joined Federated Wireless. What led you now to, to Federated? When I look back, I've been in wireless for probably the better part of 24 years now. And, you know, I, I, I tell people I've been around long enough to remember when it was just 1G. And, and every time you see us change to a new G, whether it's 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, you know, with regards to technology, uh, now we're headed to 5G. You see these radical shifts in the marketplace and they're radical technology shifts. And everything from going to digital, to going to apps, to going to the iPhone, to becoming mobile internet. And now as we head into this new world of 5G, which really is, uh, is going to enable uh, the industrial internet of things, right? Help us move to that industry 4.0. As I was kind of, you know, I had worked for these companies, it was probably before, before I went to Samsung, I worked for the Intel IoT group. And this is the very beginning conversation, right? We were all still very shiny new object. How exciting was IoT? And at the time, we're acquiring all kinds of companies. Um, we're building this really great value proposition. It was gaining momentum. But what was always the long pull in the tent for us, the thing that always kept us from really having great breakthroughs with enterprises was connectivity. And connectivity was really the weak link, the weakest link of the entire solution set that we bring to the table while at Intel. And so uh, at that point in time, I think Intel lost a little bit of its steam and momentum began to start uh, dissolving companies. I went back into the wireless side of things with, with Samsung and was approached uh, by Iyad and his team, and I'd met Iyad Tarazi, our CEO, many years before, about having the opportunity to work in something that was completely disruptive in the wireless world, that was not just disruptive, but it was cloud-based, which meant it gave it scale architecture. And at first, I wasn't super interested, but the more I talked with him, the more I talked with the team, the more I began to recognize that if I wasn't a part of this great movement, that I would be kicking myself forever. And so I agreed to join the team about a year and a half, 18 months ago. Haven't looked back. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and, and it's funny that you mentioned when you were with Intel, I mean, that was not so long ago, right? That was 2013, 14, 15. And, um, you know, and at that time, we were just setting up, uh, you know, IoT One in 2015. And it was really, the question was, what is IoT? You know, I mean, you go to conferences and everybody has a slide, like, here's what IoT is. And quite rapidly, you know, at least awareness has progressed. I think the technology has progressed in many, in many aspects. From a connectivity standpoint, from then to now, have you seen already very significant improvement in connectivity or is it, is it 5G and, and maybe the coming five years where you expect to see that, um, that step forward? So what I think is driving the connectivity revolution, if you want to call it that, is that there has always been a massive demand for private wireless. It really has been. The traditional connectivity models, if you take a look at how much of the, the US today is, is actually connected, less than 2% of most office buildings in America have adequate connection. 
And so it wasn't for it wasn't for lack of technology. It was really for lack of, of, of a business model that made sense. And what's really driving that connectivity disruption today is cloud scale. And for the first time, and this this is what really didn't we really didn't have available to us back in 2013 when I was at was at Intel, was that cloud scale really is driving the connectivity innovation today. And and you can't pick up a newspaper today without seeing uh, an article about all of the major players, many of which I used to work with, whether it's Amazon or Microsoft or VMware or Dell or, or everybody is making announcements, Amazon, about some cloud technology investment, some cloud technology advancement that's all about trying to drive innovation and connectivity and compute at the cloud level and in, in for enterprise. And so I think, I think cloud is really what's been the transformative technology that's bringing it to the forefront today. Gotcha. Cloud, you know, at least when, when I think about cloud, I think most, most people think about cloud, they think about data storage and processing, aggregation and so forth. Um, do these companies, AWS, Microsoft, and so forth, do they also have a role in providing connectivity? Or is it you know, the combination of cloud services with the services provided by the wireless carriers that we're talking about here? So, so they are actually making significant strides in connectivity. So, for example, uh, Microsoft recently announced right that they acquired Affirmed Networks. They're now into the, into the software-based switching business. Amazon has strengthened its cloud portfolio with, with Snowcone. I'm not sure how much you know about, about Snowcone and Outpost and the, and the Edge Solutions, but they're basically new devices, new technology that helps drive cloud-based network functionality. And it's really advancing at a very, very rapid pace, more so than even the first year I was with Federated, uh, the rate at which enterprises are, are demanding that somehow they participate in this revolution of cloud scale connectivity. Okay, interesting. Well, this is then a great headway into Federated Wireless and in, in, in what your business is. So maybe we can start with the basics. You know, who, who do you serve? What are the problems that they have? And you know, what's the value proposition? So basically, Federated Wireless is a what we call a spectrum administrator. The industry calls it a SaaS, S-A-S, a spectrum administrative service. And our core functionality, and the way we started out was we're about five years old, but we didn't become commercial until the FCC made the CBRS spectrum band commercially available back in February. And so for us strategically, you know, we are built by wireless carrier people. Our CEO used to run R&D for Nextel. So we're, we're built and run by many, many people that have had very successful careers in the wireless industry. And so who we are in this space is that, that when the FCC made this spectrum without going too deep available, that there's a handful of us, there's, there's us, there's Google, there's Comscope, that have been certified by the FCC to be, I guess I'd call property managers, for lack of a better term, of 150 megahertz of mid-band spectrum that sits between 3.55 and 3.7. So it's that really good mid-band, long range, high capacity, low latency. It's that great 5G spectrum. And, And as a caretaker of this spectrum, Federated Wireless has really kind of established ourselves over the last handful of years as kind of a market leader for the development of making spectrum allocation possible. We're entirely built in the cloud. Our entire solution, as massive as it is, is built in the cloud. We, we currently have built this thing and we test it regularly to be able to handle up to a million connectivities at any given moment. So again, you start talking about cloud scale, the importance of cloud scale. We are cloud scale. And so from a technology standpoint, what Federated Wireless does today is we're, we are technology enablers and that we make this spectrum readily available to enterprises, to wireless carriers, to cable companies, to rural wireless, to anybody that that is seeking to participate in the shared spectrum model. Shared in the sense that it's not shared between enterprises, it's only shared with incumbents like the Department of Defense, that if they say they need it, we need to move whoever's in their little space to a different space. And so uh, we can get into that part of the conversation a little bit later, but that's kind of a high level of who we are and what role we're kind of playing today. And this year is that we, we started out primarily as a 
spectrum property manager, for lack of a better term. That makes sense. That makes sense. And and I mean, connectivity is on the one hand, it's very uh, it's very horizontal solution. Everybody requires it, and it's it's commodity to some extent. But then there are unique requirements by different industries. Are there specific verticals that you're focused on right now, or or is it more just seeing where the market arises? To begin with, we were primarily focusing on the wireless carrier market. A number of the wireless carriers we support today in the U.S., you know, the Verizons of the world, the T-Mobiles of the world, um, and then on to the, to the cable companies, the Comcast and, and, and the Charters and the Dishes of the world. You know, they're all looking for different reasons, but we primarily were operating as that property manager between them and really high quality spectrum that wasn't out there on the, you know, wasn't was it could be acquired by means other than just purely auction that is generally made available to everyone, right? The FCC came out um, and their goal and their goal continues to be to make as much spectrum available as possible, right? They want to continue. And I think, I think it goes back maybe, gosh, let me see, maybe seven or eight years. Uh, one of the administrations, their goal was to advance 5G growth and technology in the U.S. by opening up roughly 500 megahertz of new spectrum that could be dedicated to the advancement of 5G. The CBRS band, which is this 150 megahertz we sit in, we're talking about today, is part of that 500. We'll we'll talk a little bit later about some new advancements and developments in in the sharing spectrum space. But that's, that's that's kind of how we started out, was we started out by providing spectrum. And we were approached, I want to say probably two years ago by Amazon, where Amazon wanted to, to, to do some cool testing with us on, on, on artificial intelligent video cameras. And, and we began to recognize that, that there was an ecosystem towards really making connectivity available that was missing. Because there's a handful of components and a number of people that play a big role, whether it's radio manufacturers or packet core, there's a number of components that go into making connectivity available for an enterprise. But at that point, when Amazon approached us, we really recognized that we're not all really working that well together. And we hadn't figured out how to make this easy for the enterprise customer yet. Because it was kind of business as usual. I buy my radio from these RAN vendors. I get my switching from this vendor. You know, I have these people design and install my network. Um, I have somebody else manage it. Maybe I manage it myself. And with a spectrum allocation model like CBRS, you really can't run private connectivity that way because the long pole in the tent is there's only a handful of us that are actually allowed to manage the spectrum. So. We recognized the importance. We, we strategically went back to our investment community. We went back to, to the leadership of our organization. And we created a second product, which is becoming a new core product for us today. And it's called Connectivity as a Service. And really simply, and we're going to talk, I'm going to guess a lot about Connectivity as a Service today. Really simply, to us, Connectivity as a Service is, it's we can deliver to your enterprise a turnkey CBRS wireless network. What does that mean? That means that Federated Wireless today, we help you plan it. We help you design it. Maybe you need a radio design, depending upon how big the network is. We work with nationwide installers. We actually install it for you. And we already had a 24 by 7 manned network operations center because we were built by wireless people. We, as part of our SLAs today, we, we make available spectrum with five nines SLAs. And so we plan, we design, we build, we manage that wireless network on your behalf. Because what we found is that most of the enterprises we talk to today, they don't want to build and manage wireless networks. They, they want someone to just do it for them. So they can focus on the things they are interested in, like enterprise application development. You know, we're starting to see a big shift of the IT budget move today from, from investment in IT to investment in applications. And so by us showing up with a turnkey wireless network, you know, we have enabled the enterprise community today with private wireless LTE. 
uh, with a roadmap to 5G. Meaning what? Meaning that we're ready for 5G now. Right? The spectrum is the spectrum. We're, Federated Wireless is ready today for 5G. It's just that the ecosystem is beginning to catch up to us, like the hardware or the handsets. You know, we see growth and evolution in those every day. We, we're beginning to see the 5G ecosystem around CBRS begin to develop. And so we are we are 4G private LTE with a roadmap to 5G next year. So that's that's kind of our new offer and what we're what we're making available to the marketplace today. When we think about the the types of enterprises that you'd be working with, these are is it correct that these are typically a campus environments, so um, stadiums, malls, airports, or would there also be use cases for this? And for example, connected vehicles or connected healthcare devices, something that would be disparate. Um, so is this is this primarily a campus service? So we're finding today that the biggest use cases driving us come from you're correct the the venue environment, the campus environment. You know, for, for both outdoor and indoor, as well as the venue environment. You know, we've done uh, some cool deployments in venues like uh, Angel Stadium. But we're also finding that, that, that smart manufacturing, I probably have spent more time on energy companies and smart manufacturing in the last four weeks than I had in the prior five months combined talking with some of the largest logos uh, inside America when it comes to manufacturing, automotive, and energy. And so we're now beginning to find that those use cases are moving into utilities and energy, smart manufacturing, supply chain. And when you start talking about the smart office or smart building environment, COVID-19 has really, really got a lot of people thinking very differently about what will back to work look like? You know, what will those back to work applications or use cases that, are, that don't exist today that they're going to need? very rapidly to create an environment where people feel safe coming back to work. So we're, we're beginning to see across a whole bunch of verticals. And now, I guess I should add another one to it because I was just on a meeting this morning, retail. Retail is now becoming a very, very big one. Okay. Okay. Great. And there's just one point that I, I wanted to kind of clarify or dig into a little bit on the CBRS. So just for our listeners, CBRS stands for Citizens Broadband Radio Service. There are, if I understand correctly, there are basically incumbents. So um, this this spectrum was previously allocated to military or government, and now the the government is making this available for commercial use, and you're managing it. And then is it the case where, let's say, Canada invades and the military has all of a sudden a need for a lot more spectrum, you would need to orchestrate the the, the opening up of that spectrum or the, the shift back to to government access for a period of time. Is that kind of the dynamic here where the spectrum was being underutilized, but it was allocated to the government and now it's being opened up, but there's still maybe some extreme cases where there might need to be uh, kind of a shift back to the original uh, users. Can you just help me understand a bit? The dynamic? So today we recognize three incumbents. We recognize commercial fixed satellite service. We recognize uh, grandfather fixed point multi-point providers. And we also recognize the, the U.S. Navy radar. And so when I talk about Department of Defense, it really represents roughly 14 aircraft carriers in the U.S. Navy. And what that means is that one of the things that really differentiates us in the marketplace today, and there's a lot of kind of quirky rules, and this is some of the stuff we'll talk about later that sometimes is a barrier to entry with customers is trying to explain the rules. So we. The Navy said that, well, we will, in the coastal markets, we will share our spectrum with you under the condition that if within, I think it's 200 miles, or I'm going to say 90 miles off the coast of all the coastal U.S., if an aircraft carrier comes on and says, okay, we now have a need for the spectrum, and I, I think I need to double check, but I think it's used in flight, landing, and taking off on aircraft carriers. But if we need this spectrum, then we have to, number one, sense that they're asking for it. And then two, anybody that exists in a designated protected area. And so a designated protected area is typically every 40 kilometers is kind of chopped into little slices up and down the coasts is recognized as an individual designated protected area. And that protected area goes about 90 miles out into the water and 200 miles inland. So we roughly have five primary Navy ports in the U.S. 
And so within each designated protected area, it's required by a SaaS provider in order to make it available 100 of the 150, because in the lower 100 megahertz, the Navy can be anywhere and ask anywhere within the lower 100. So anywhere in that lower 100, we have to be prepared to take you, if you've got a solution and it happens to be in the exact same, the exact same spectrum band that the Navy just asked for, we will pick you up and temporarily move you somewhere else in the full range of 150 that's available. And the asks are typically 20 megahertz chunks. So we may take your 10 or 20 megahertz chunk and move you somewhere else for a period of time and then move you back when the Navy is done. What, why that's such a value add proposition for federated wireless is that our leadership recognize that fundamental to being a leader in this industry, you have got to be able to make available as much spectrum as possible. And if you don't have an ESC network, and ESC stands for environmental sensory capability, if you don't have an ESC network in place, then you're not even allowed to offer any of that 100 megahertz 200 miles inland from the coast, where, wherever you want to operate business. So, Brian, maybe we can then get a bit more. But I think I, I want to go into the um, also kind of uh, where the technology is moving. Maybe first we can cover the, the business in a little bit greater detail. So the model here, it's a connectivity as a service, which implies that this is going to be primarily a, a kind of a service-based, maybe a monthly fee structure. But what would that look like? Let's say there's a, an airport that wants to sign up for connectivity as a service. What would be basically the, the business or the, the investment for them? Our business model is intentionally very simple. We, we try to keep everything about how we do business as simple as possible. If I could figure out a way to put on all of my presentations a great big red easy button, I would. Our pricing model is intentionally very simple. When we come in and plan and design and build and manage your network, we have two billing components to that. The first one is the installation, the design and installation. We typically charge for design and installation up front. Now, that cost will vary depending upon whether it's an indoor installation or an outdoor installation. But roughly it's around oh, anywhere from $1,000 to $1,200 per radio to design and install your network. So let's use as an example, you've got a 100,000 square foot warehouse. You know, we typically find that you know, because the coverage is so good with CBRS radios, we typically find that about every 6,000 square feet, you need a new radio, maybe every 5,000 if there's some complexity in the warehouse. So that you're probably looking at anywhere from 100,000 square foot warehouse, you're probably looking anywhere from, let's say, 15, 12 to 15 radios. So you would pay the $1,200 per radio times 12 to 15 radios would be your flat design and installation costs. Well, the great thing about CBRS as a deployment is it's not your typical DAS network. It actually looks and installs a lot like Wi-Fi. It's all cloud-based. It's servers and a few radios. And that's really it. And so from an installation standpoint, it's very simple. We, we can typically stand something up in less than a week. And so the second component of our billing is an ongoing monthly fee. And included that ongoing monthly fee, and for indoor it's 370 a month per radio. And included in that is the spectrum management, the 24 by 7 knock, the radios. So we, we include the, we bring the radios and include the radios, and all of the server and software-based switching packet core that goes with that. So all in about 1200 for design installation per radio and about 370 a month on a three-year contract for all of, the, uh, all of the, the monthly ongoing management, including radios and packet core. You know, so that customers aren't buying radios and packet core out. We're bringing that, making it part of our fee. Gotcha. And, and will that be the same when 5G rolls out or is there, is there going to be then a different cost structure around 5G? The only thing that would make the cost structure a little different is the cost of the radio. So, so we work today with best-in-class vendors we, we select them so that we can continually drive costs out of the market by 
using a handful of vendors that we use across a whole large group of market marketplaces, right? Because uh, they can, you know, the radios are the radios. It really depends on the cost of the radio itself. We won't change the cost of our management. We won't change the cost of our design installation. The only thing that could potentially change is how expensive is that 5G radio compared to the cost of those radios today? And, and we're committed to continually driving the cost of those radios down in the marketplace just by sheer volume in the market, by, by being out there and, and doing as many installations with as many business partners as we can. Hey, okay, great. Well, let's get into 5G rollout a bit then. I mean, you know, I, I'm based here in Shanghai and of course the Chinese government is pushing you know, 5G very, very hard in China. So there's on the one hand, a, a fairly high level of awareness around 5G, but I would say there's still a fairly low level of awareness, including with myself, frankly, around what are really going to be the, the, the actual on the ground impacts so if we, if we maybe look at a, a manufacturing environment or a warehouse environment as an example, maybe you can walk us through how do you see 5G transforming the, the types of use cases uh, that can be deployed or, or the, let's say, the reliability or functionality of use cases that are maybe already uh, employed? How, how, how would you expect this to actually impact for the end users, the experience? Well, clearly 5G will impact end users significantly, right? You know, you're able to do so much more with less. Right, you're able to you're able to handle so many more endpoints with the same number of radios, and so just from pure scale perspective, we all know that 5G really will help scale very rapidly IoT. Again, coming back to why it's so important, you have cloud scale capability so that you can rapidly add more radios, add new things. For us, and this is kind of interesting, Eric, is that that. To me, it's interesting how many conversations begin with, even, even government contracts where, where we're heavily involved, where the requirement, it's got to be 5G. And it's like, well, 5G, like we all talk about it, isn't quite here yet. We're still waiting for the devices, the handsets, the, the equipment in the ecosystem. We're, we're really waiting for them to catch up. From a CBRS standpoint, from using CBRS spectrum, to deliver 5G solutions, we typically put ourselves out there in our marketing material, in our presentations, in our conversations with customers that, hey, what, what we can deliver today is we can deliver private LTE 4G with an on-ramp to 5G, meaning what? Meaning that when that ecosystem is available, that doesn't change anything about what we do within our spectrum allocation manager. It will change the installation of some new radios. I think it will change probably a lot of the partnerships that I have today. So I have a number of partnerships with IoT application people because I'm delivering the network. They're delivering the application. We, we co-sell a lot together. I think it'll rapidly change maybe the profile of some of the IoT applications for the good, but fundamental to being able to handle a rapid a rapid expansion of just sheer end users or measurement or more devices that you're measuring or more things that you're able to do, you know, because 5G does give you that capability. Fundamental to that has got to be the ability to cloud scale. And if you have a cloud-based architecture, for me, I can rapidly turn up hundreds of thousands of devices on any customer in a matter of days. And literally, you can, you can activate a new radio in my system in a matter of seconds because we're able to scale the spectrum allocation engine that sits behind the whole thing. And so for us, we, we actually are very excited about 5G. We, we honestly believe that we're going to be a huge, huge part of 5G. For the simple reason is that the market now believes that the shared spectrum model works. We're also beginning to see enterprises making massive investments into and the ecosystem into cloud-based architecture and marrying up the ability for us to deliver a cloud architecture-centric spectrum solution combined with their applications and their edge compute capabilities are also cloud architecture driven. The long pole and the tent just becomes let's get those devices, let's get those, we can't get those fast enough and really begin to really drive industry 
you know, because we finally have all of the components in place. But we're still we're still a ways from that, right? We're still probably a good year, year and a half from that. And, and we're seeing that companies are looking to make investments today to begin to transform a lot of functionality of their business. They like us because nothing changes. It's, it's the same spectrum. It's the same vendor. It's just different radios. And we handle that for them. So talking about the time horizon here, so you say maybe a year, year and a half, maybe until 5G is, is kind of practically available and in, in, in some devices are out there on market. But when we talk about industrial, you know, the, the life cycles move much more slowly or they're much longer than they are in the consumer. Do you expect if we look out, I mean, what would be a, a time horizon for when you expect more of the industrial hardware to be 5G ready? You know, we're, we're still looking late 2021, early 2022. You know, we'll, we've already been kind of testing some things in our labs. I would expect that by the end of this year, the first part of next year, we'll begin going through rapid testing in our labs with these devices. But then again, you know, once you have something to test it and build, it takes a little bit of time to rapidly ramp up manufacturing to create these things. So um, it, it could take us a little bit of time. So I, I think you'll start seeing devices available in the market year, year and a half. How long will it take for that to trickle down past the wireless carriers to enterprise? Maybe a little bit longer. Yeah, I'm thinking, so if I'm not an expert here, and I, I think most of our listeners are also not experts. So if we think about a few different device categories. We can think, okay, mobile phone will be pretty quick because those turn over every, every couple of years. Then we have maybe like um, AR you know, glasses or, or wearables. Those might also, I would assume, be relatively quick, maybe, maybe what, maybe three years or something, but a little, bit, uh, a little bit longer than a mobile phone. And then we have devices like um, AGVs, for example, uh, in warehouses, and, and they might have a lifetime of you know, 10 years or, or 20 years. As we move through these different asset classes, would you expect the, the 5G enablement to be significantly different for different each asset class? Or would it be that even an AGV that has uh, maybe a 15-year life cycle, you would expect that people would just modify, just add a radio, modify them, and then they'd be 5G enabled also relatively quickly? I use AGVs as an example. We're actually seeing that today. I'm, I'm doing some testing with an automobile manufacturer today where where we are really just simply upgrading the radio. We're upgrading it from Wi-Fi to, to private LTE for GCBRS. You know, and the ecosystem today exists with everything from routers to, to, uh, um, to gateways. You know, that, that ecosystem is being, is, is already exists today with pretty large scale for CBRS. I think that's where you'll start to see the transformative things take place within the entire device ecosystem. Of course, the consumer devices are always kind of leading the market. We've kind of seen that today in 5G Point as, as an example. But I, I think you'll see that we're very rapidly that the ecosystem of devices, the routers, the gateways, the things that really talk to devices um, inside smart manufacturing or utilities, the things that really drive, you know, really are talking to the radios, the things that are really gathering that data, collecting that data, moving between devices and between the cloud. I think you'll see that that comes a little bit faster than the five-year time frame. I think this is the kind of stuff we're testing right now, and we think will start to be developed at year, year and a half time frame, along with radios. So there's another topic here, which is uh, it's probably something you come up across regularly for the at least manufacturing space, which is the topic of, of cybersecurity. Would 5G have any implications, whether positive or negative, for securing assets or data in transit? Yeah, one of the things relative, and let's, I'm going to keep in the context of CBRS because that's that's you know that's my strength. You know, I don't want to talk on behalf of the whole industry, but from a security standpoint, one of the things that is such a huge value proposition for us, it's always one of the first things we have to address, is that when I first begin by telling you that most of my compute happens in a public cloud, you start seeing people get a little nervous. You start seeing people. This has been the wireless carriers, some of the bigger energy companies and utilities. The thought of having some level of compute actually take place outside their network makes them very, very nervous. And so we've actually designed our solution such that everything with the exception of spectrum allocation in our connectivity as a service solution actually happens behind their firewall. So the levels of protocol that exist today that are already 
you know, in that security solution, you know, such that all data is authenticated and encrypted already and it sits behind their firewall. Today, um, everything within the CBRS ecosystem we deploy is already following the three GPP standards. And so, you know, we're inherently adopting that entire ecosystem of security standard that all the wireless industry under 3GPP already follows today. As we move to 5G, especially in the hardware and devices, we'll just continue to migrate to that exact to that new standard. And so we won't we won't see any disruption. If anything, we'll probably see that we strengthen our ability to provide a fully blown private network that you own and manage the network. You own and manage all the data. We don't touch the data. It's yours. But we're able to to deliver it in such a way that we put everything behind your firewall. All the endpoints are behind your firewall. You know, traditional DAS would put the endpoints outside your firewall and, and push the data to you. Not in a CBRS dedicated spectrum environment, you get all the data. So when you start talking about in the context of 5G, it doesn't really change as much. It just means that we'll continue to evolve our security standards just like the industry is with as they evolve 3GPP into the 5G standards. Okay, clear. So I, I'd like to get into a case study, but before we go there, are there any other aspects of, kind of the technology or the solution that we haven't covered yet that you think are important? No, I can't really think of anything. I mean, there's always a bunch of ancillary things, but you know, I think I think we covered the bulk of it. You know, when it comes to CBRS, I, I typically find, and maybe this is a good transition for the use cases, is that what I typically find is that that there's a lot of confusion around the rules of CBRS. And I typically find that customers fall into one of two categories. Either one, they don't want to mess with the network. They just want you to deliver it. They want it to work. They want to focus on their applications and their use cases. You bring us the network. And if I have an IoT partner that's trying, that is really good at solving the problem that they have, then I bring them with me too. You know, and when we, we all three work together. And so that's one kind of customer. I think at the end, most customers will be like that. But then there's this other kind of customer. And this is the large utilities. This is the really large global manufacturers. This is the large logistics transportation companies. These are businesses that have been leveraging wireless technologies for many, many years. And they have teams of people whose job is to manage wireless networks. And it's interesting is, as I meet with them, many of these people came from the wireless industry where they were managing a wireless network. Now they're doing it for an oil company, or now they're doing it for an electrical utility company. So what makes the two different kinds of use cases interesting is that it's very easy for me to have the conversation around, I'll bring the network, don't worry about the details, it's turnkey, I will manage it to 5.9's SLA. That, that's, a, that's a very different conversation when it comes to use cases versus trying to have that same conversation with those other really mega companies that already have teams of people that look at this stuff. And so I typically find when I get into the kinds of companies and use cases that want to deploy solutions in energy or utilities or mega manufacturing, that we spend a lot of time just talking about CBRS to really fully understand the rules, to really get into the details, to really want to kind of pull the components apart. And it can very, it can sometimes, and it has been in the last couple of months for me, it's, it's been a little difficult bringing the conversation back to what was the original problem we were trying to solve here? Let's not get hung up on the wireless technology. We can all agree it's good. But they want to, you know, you got a lot of cooks in the kitchen. They want to touch it and do things with it and break it up and, and, and feel like they're a part of the process. And so for me, from a use case standpoint, I typically find we get involved in two very, very different types. And the lead cycle, as I'm sure you can imagine, is very different for both of those. So maybe we, can talk about, maybe we can talk about both kinds today. Yeah, yeah, perfect. I mean, maybe we start with the, the first, uh, let's say the, the simpler case. And it would be actually useful, I, sh I should have asked this earlier, but useful to understand who in that circumstance you would actually be speaking with initially. I mean, are we talking about VP of manufacturing or are we talking about the CIO? Where would this conversation even originate for a company that doesn't have a dedicated team for managing wireless? 
most of these conversations originate in IT. Most of these conversations we're finding is that, and this is what I find super fascinating about this new world of private wireless, is that we're beginning to see a radical shift of where the budget exists. We're seeing a shift of who the new decision or the, the, the people in power are. We're, we're talking to IT now. And that we've seen systematically is that IT wants to spend less and less on IT infrastructure. And that's why they're, they really, really embrace cloud native architecture. They want to spend less time talking about the wireless network and more time talking about and playing with the applications that we enable. So let, let me start with one use case. It was a company that is a manufacturer that has retail locations throughout America that coexist with a warehouse of parts. And the use case challenge they had was that, and this answers your first question, is it's the people that were running the Wi-Fi networks. And they were the problem they were having was that so many people were trying to use the Wi-Fi in this 80,000 square foot building where you have a front end showroom and you have a back end warehouse. You had, you had everybody using it for communications. You had the front end using it for digital displays and they were also using it for point of sale and they were using it for iPads walking around to interact with customers in real time. Some of the items they were selling in the showroom were all Wi-Fi connected to show you the cool features of the connected thing they were selling. And that was being shared with the people in the warehouse. They're trying to run inventory logistics. They're trying to run supply chain. They're trying to do barcode scanning as well as corporate communications. And so the Wi-Fi network very rapidly became very, very taxed. And, and I think what's super fascinating to me about about CBRS as a technology is that we don't position it as this technology to replace the thing you're doing. We position it as an augmentation to your existing Wi-Fi network or your existing internet service provider or your existing use of unlicensed spectrum or the current use you have of a, of a uh, um, wireless carrier that you might be using from some of these solutions. So this whole complex was using Wi-Fi. And they brought us in just to focus on, rather than try and beef up and build a better, more secure Wi-Fi network, they brought us in just to help manage inventory logistics, barcode scanners, and the barcode scanners could then, could then automatically load and feed the inventory system. And so because the back end represented a 50,000 square foot warehouse, we were able to, in less than one week, come out and install, I think we installed six indoor, what they call CBSD, that's the, that's the label for a wireless radio, RAN that is used on a CBRS network, it's called a CBSD or a radio, or an access point, however you want to call it. We, we came in and we installed six access points and stood the entire network up, connecting into their network, because it all sat on the backside of their firewall in less than a week. And in less than a week, we were using their barcode scanner application. And so because we're, we've seen a very rapid expansion of the ecosystem of people participating in the CBRS band. So as you might already know today, everything that's been coming out with Apple since the last release and Samsung and LG um, are all... CBRS band enabled. All of the companies like Zebra that develop and build really ruggedized tablets. And by the way, the new iPad coming out is also going to be fully enabled with the new CBRS band. So we're able to take these ruggedized tablets made by Zebra and they loaded their Windows-based inventory system and barcode scanning application on it. And they were able to within one week, completely transform the logistics in the back of this warehouse because people are using scanners and then in real time populating the inventory control system without having to use the Wi-Fi network. Now, here's what's really exciting is that once the network is in place, it's very easy to add new things to the network. 
So we're in conversations with them today about security cameras because security cameras today use up a tremendous amount of bandwidth. And if your security cameras today are being run using a wireless carrier SIM, um, just the sheer amount of data and the overages that you'll pay are, are, are ridiculous. So they're outrageous. And so when you own your own spectrum, you own the spectrum. It's unlimited usage. All you can eat, do whatever you want with it. So now they're looking at, because there's so much bandwidth available on this new simple network, it was really just to create an offload to Wi-Fi. They're now looking at adding security cameras to the back because they've already got the network in place. And now it's just a simple function of, I've got another new network that has a lot of bandwidth. The latency on it is super, super low. So I can begin to add new applications. Maybe I might not otherwise be able to add onto a Wi-Fi network. So that's been a really cool use case. What I'm excited is that this particular company has locations all over America now. And so once we're, we get to the use case, then we have to elevate that conversation to somebody much more senior within the IoT organization. It will end up with the CIO. But initially, these conversations begin with IT people that run Wi-Fi networks or are responsible for what I would call the wireless networking solutions inside a large company. That's where conversations begin. Okay. Okay. Fascinating. And you mentioned here that you know Zebra and um, Apple and so forth, some of the manufacturers that are CBRS enabled. If you can give a percentage right now, what proportion of devices would you assume are CBRS enabled? And if they're not enabled, does it mean that they're, they're then just uh, not able to use the network or that they have some limited functionality on the network? So band 48 is the CBRS radio band. And so we talk about does a, does a cell phone or a tablet or a laptop or a push-to-talk device, do any of these things have the band 48 radio in them? And today, there's over 25 handsets that have the CBRS band. All of the iPhone 11s and everything beyond that has the band. All of the Google Pixel 3, 4, and 4XL have it. All the Samsung, 10, anything 10 and above, and everything new just being released has it, has band 48. All of the LG, the LG 50, the G8 ThinQ, the G8 ThinkX, and now all the OnePlus, the 7 Pro 7T, 7 Pro 5G, 8 Pro, the Motorola Turbo Nitro, the push-to-talk device, all of those today are band 40 enabled. It's going to take a couple of years, and this is, this is why... And, and, and here's another interesting fact too, right? All these devices are coming out with dual SIM technology, right? You have your primary SIM and an eSIM. And I think what you're going to find is that these eSIMs are what people will use in their enterprise solutions to empower people with the device to do data when on the campus, to do things when on the campus. And you'll see it managed through eSIM. And we, because of the way we architect our solution, we put the entire eSIM control in the hands of the enterprise. It's not controlled outside of them. And so here's what I think is gonna happen, Eric. It's gonna take a couple of years before we stop seeing iPhone 8s out there, iPhone 6s out there. I think over time, as an example, you're gonna start seeing as devices retire, all these devices that are being made today, the whole ecosystem of devices being made today, all now incorporate Band 48. And it's just a matter of time. It's like asking me, well, well, how long is it till everybody gets rid of their Samsung Galaxy 9s and only has a 10 and above? Or how long until everybody gets rid of their iPhone 10s and only has an 11 and above? Well, well that's, gonna, that's how long it's going to take in order for the consumer SIM side of things to really grow. But on the enterprise side, we're able to manage and, and use these today. And this is how they're managing, especially things like laptops or tablets, especially those today. You know, we're also seeing that the same company that wanted me to come in and, and transform their backend logistics in one of their manufacturing facilities. They just went for, it's, it's, they've got a bunch of remote offices that are outdoor ancillary to the manufacturing. So they can't quite get Wi-Fi all the way out to the remote buildings of this manufacturing campus. And they just want to use 
CBRS as the backbone network because all these gateways and routers already exist where I plug in a, 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 a gateway and it's taking as the backbone and on one side CBRS, but it's broadcasting Wi-Fi. So, so another use case I'm working on right now is a very popular outdoor concert venue that has been using Wi-Fi today and has now come to us and asking him to help design, well, how would a CBRS network, how could I leverage CBRS network one to monetize all the people coming to my outdoor venue, but two, provide a higher quality of access to everybody that's here. Well, for the first couple of years, it'll probably be, we'll be making Wi-Fi and applications available to allow them to interact with everybody that's a concert goer because these gateways will broadcast Wi-Fi with a CBRS backbone architecture. But going forward, we're looking two to three years down the road. And the conversation we're having is, how can CBRS enable 100,000 people showing up to the venue? That's the conversation we're having. So we're, we're two to three years away as to answer your question about device population from seeing the devices themselves fully interacting out of the box with CBRS networks. Great, very interesting. And should we should we then wrap up with this um, this use case regarding one of the, let's say the um, utilities or, or kind of global manufacturers? Absolutely. So I'm working with a, I'll use a utility as an example. The buying cycle is very different. You know, now you're talking to people that are, are, they run wireless networks. You can actually go out to the internet and find a lot of published white papers. So I'm not, I'm not speaking out of turn here, but the, the one in particular I'm working with is struggling with the fact that they have, they manage 11 different wireless networks today. And that's everything from unlicensed spectrums to licensed spectrums to mobile network operator spectrum to Wi-Fi solutions. They have so many networks that they have to manage today. And they're, they're actually looking at a way to do two things leveraging CBRS. One, they're looking at a way to just consolidate some of these networks to a, a more reliable technology. If all you're doing is monitoring something, which is pretty typical with the utility, then many of the wireless solutions they have in place today, they really work fine. But they recognize that in order to transform to the smart grid, to be able to transform into a world where, where utilities today are very much omnidirectional, meaning somebody generates the power, somebody wholesales the power, and people consume the power. Nothing comes back the other way. But when you start looking at all of these these what they call share applications or these share technologies employed throughout Europe today, where you create a share environment. They're testing this in, in, I was reading, they're doing some cool tests in Texas today, where think about the Airbnb model, which is really simply, I am a person that has an unutilized asset. I'm going to rent out my, rent out a bedroom. I'm going to rent out something. I was watching the news the other day. And many, many places in the South where the heat wave is, it's called pool share. People are now Airbnb being out there swimming pool for the day. Right? It's crazy. But, but in this world of asset share, you're beginning to start seeing a tremendous amount, especially in the Southwestern and the Southern states, of people generating electricity. And today, they also have the capacity to store it like they never had before with new battery technology. And now that you have you have this share, this creation of, on the consumer side of electricity, but the whole industry has always been one directional. You create these amazing opportunities now to create new business models for people that are wholesaling in communities that now can say, I'll buy some of my power from, from the traditional way that I get power, but then I'll turn and I'll look at the consumers and I will buy power from them and I can then redistribute that power to other people. And, and I can radically lower the overall cost of generating power. Because today, the consumption model, the wholesale model is very difficult. It's You have to plan and try and plan for the peaks and valleys of usage. And you might pre-buy your energy with the expectation that there'll be an energy spike. And if you miss an energy spike, then you, you pay all kinds of royalties on top of overage, just like you would with a wireless carrier. We're working with a, a company today looking at 
well, how can how can CBRS play a role in the wireless connectivity part of this new ecosystem that's happening? The same company is talking to us about the upstream of how can we do a better job of managing our wind farms? And it's one thing to measure data. The wireless networks in place today do a great job of that. But if you need mobile edge compute capability, if you need, the, if you need to move decisions out to the edge of the network, one thing that we found is great about the way we have structured CBRS or wireless network in a box, if you want to call it that, right? We deliver the turnkey. Because we're cloud enabled, we work seamlessly with cloud infrastructure of not just the customers, but also the whole ecosystem of partners. So for example, today, we're partnered up with every cloud person out there in developing and these mobile edge compute solutions. We're, we're part of the Microsoft Azure Edge stack for IoT solutions. We're part of the, the Amazon stack for solutions. We now are engaged in these, these really large cloud companies that are just looking for a different way to get that data that it's low cost and secure in a way that is cost effective for the use cases. So what's the buying cycle like for a company like that that's looking at me to help build the Airbnb for, for personal, personal generation of electricity at the same time drive all kinds of new cool edge compute capabilities for the wind farms? It's a really complicated sales cycle. There are a lot of people involved in that discussion. Um, we typically find, and, and, and if you want to talk about my go-to-market model, uh, our go-to-market model is that we typically try to hitch our wagon to partners that are really good in that ecosystem environment. So for me, is somebody going to want to come talk to me from a, a large utility about these solutions? Probably not. I mean, I've had those conversations, but I typically find that they're very, that the ecosystem with these large utilities, these large manufacturers, it is a very partner driven model for us. So we work with the large marketplace models like Amazon. We're on, we're on market, Amazon Marketplace and Azure Marketplace today. You know, it's, it's think, think, go out and buy shampoo, but think about going out and within a couple of clicks buying a wireless network. We're not there yet, we're almost there. And we're developing that capability. But we're also working with the large OEM and cloud providers. We're also working with the wireless carriers and, and the network providers. We're working with global network providers that don't have presence here in the States today, but they want us to be their presence in the States today, even though they already have large organizations here. So what I've really described to you is two different approaches. We're really working to fine-tune our go-to-market model of how can I scale rapidly in my sales model with simplified products to the enterprise side that wants nothing to do with the decision compared to large global manufacturers or large utilities and energy companies that already have an entire organization of people that have built and designed and currently manage wireless networks. Very different sales cycle for me. Very, very different conversations, but both rapidly advancing. That's been kind of cool. They all... They all seem to want it. Everybody asks me, what's the killer app out there? And there isn't one. I mean, they want them for all kinds of crazy things. And I wish there was a killer application that's driving CBRS and is driving 5G. But right now, it's anybody that has a process that can be made more effective, drive more data, make decision-making better because they have a low-cost wireless network. Those are the applications driving the industry right now. Yeah, I mean that's both the, the beauty and the challenge of the industrial IoT is that there's there's no killer app, but there are you know just a, a countless number of high value apps that are context specific, right? So for for specific users. So it sounds then like there's actually quite a, a large range of different companies that might have an interest in in getting in touch with uh, Federated Wireless, whether they're an end user that are deploying a solution for their facility or whether they're a service provider that's, that's trying to figure out how to improve the, the quality of the applications that they're deploying for their customers. What's the best way for somebody, uh, Brian, to, to reach out to you or, or to reach out more generally to Federated Wireless? So we have a, we have a customer portal 
at federatedwireless.com. And everybody that comes to that portal with, it's very simply, it's just a very simple interactive, here's what I'm looking to do, here's what I'm looking to learn more about, about the technology, or I've got some things I'm trying to do with it, can you help me? And that portal is screened every single day. The things that are that are looking to drive solutions today, they typically end up on my team somewhere or with me. And we address those every single day. And so if somebody has an interest and is looking to drive a conversation, um, you will get a response very, very quickly. And you'll be engaged usually within 24 to 48 hours with somebody on, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to learn about it? How can this help you? And honestly, I mean, you know, CBRS isn't for everyone because if your use case is good with Wi-Fi or with a real low narrow band, you know, use it, you know, use that. But if you're really trying to drive a lot of volume, if you're trying to scale rapidly, if you're trying to create solutions that have super low latency, or if you're an ecosystem partner that's looking for you to partner with us because we think you bring a really cool IoT application to the table that we can partner up with. We, we love those kind of partners because people don't want to talk to me about networks, but they really love talking to me about automatically guided vehicles, right? They want to talk about that. The, the, the network is just the thing that makes it work, but they really want to talk about the application. So I found that if I can partner up with those people and that I can bring them into my conversations, that we typically advance the sales process so much faster because I'm actually bringing you real value. I'm bringing you the solution and the network behind it, not just the network. And uh, we're currently today working on really uh, combining IoT applications with my with my network. We're working on today making combinations and packages that literally somebody could go to marketplaces and buy. It could actually go to the AWS marketplace or Azure marketplace and buy a solution. You know, I only need five radios and a real simple box, ship it to me, have it installed and, it, and with the application already on it. And, and that's actually what we're working on today to rapidly serve the broader market, which is a smaller market that doesn't have super complex windmill needs or super complex, you know, turn all of Texas into the Airbnb of electricity. That's a really bespoke conversation relative to what we think will be the bulk of people is you're just looking for a simple application solution to solve the problem and a very easy, seamless way to acquire that solution. But www.federatedwireless.com. Right. And we'll post that in the show notes. Uh, Brian, this is a super important topic that I think many people know far too little about. So I really appreciate you taking the time today to walk us through how this works and you know, explain also where we're going as, a, as an industry. Back to my first involvements with Intel back around 2013, 2015, I was so excited about the concepts and the ideas. It just, connectivity wasn't there yet. And now that cloud scale drives the new cloud connectivity, it, it's all becoming very, very real, very, very fast. And so for those of us, you know, like you with your program, like me, uh, a player in the industry, we're so excited about what the next couple of years hold for us because I thought that I'd be less busy during COVID-19 lockdown. This is the busiest I've ever been because everybody wants to have a conversation. And I mean everybody. And so we're not traveling. We're not tied up in meetings. We're not out to lunch. We're, we're all very focused on these problems. And so I'm just very, very excited and energized because I feel like this, this conversation since 2013, we've kind of, we were the shiny new object. We've come through our trough of disillusionment. And now we're really at that, that place where I believe IoT in the next couple of years is going to go through its rapid, rapid transformation. It's a good time to be in the industry, no question. Great. Well, Brian, again, thank you very much. And um, I uh, look forward to hopefully a, a, a new conversation maybe in two years. And we can see where we are once uh, 5G rolls out. Oh, I look forward to that. Take care, Eric. Good talking with you. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Industrial IoT Spotlight. 
Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at IoT1HQ and to check out our database of case studies on IoT1.com. If you have unique insight or a project deployment story to share, we'd love to feature you on a future edition. Write us at eric.walenza at iot1.com.